Welcome to another mythology video. As a gentle intro to what I'll do today, here's a bit of a warm up exercise. Here are two circles, the smaller one half the radius of the larger one. The red dot marks a point on the circumference of the smaller circle. Now imagine that the smaller circle rolls around inside the larger one. What curve will be traced by the red dot? Think about it for a second. You think you've got it? Well, let's see. As you can see, the dot traces a straight line. Pretty cool, huh? So you can draw a line using circles, who would have thought? This little miracle is called the Tusi couple and is named after the 13th century Persian astronomer and mathematician Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. I'll probably muck that one up, right? <laughs> okay, so today's video is all about the mathematics of combining circular motions and its rich history from early models of the universe to the modern theory of Fourier analysis. A special highlight will be the reconstruction of the mysterious Homer Simpson's orbit, discovered in 2008. Just wait. <laughs> okay, let's really get going by considering the orbit of our moon around the sun. Well, we all know that the earth travels around the sun on a roughly circular orbit, that the moon travels around the earth also on a roughly circular orbit, and that there are 12 and a bit lunar months in a year. Based on these three facts, try to picture the orbit of the moon around the sun. You've got it? Well, let's see. In this picture, the moon is between the sun and earth and so we are dealing with a new moon. Fast forward one lunar month and we have a new moon again. There are 11 more lunar months left in the year until earth completes its trip around the sun. So in total, we get this very pretty picture of the orbit of the moon with 12 distinctive loops corresponding to the 12 months of the year, right? Wrong. <laughs> the moon's orbit looks nothing like this. Yes, yes, we should be using ellipses, not circles. The year is not exactly 12 lunar months long. The two orbits are not exactly in the same plane and so on. But none of that gets to why our picture is really misleading. What has really mucked up our picture is that, relatively, the Earth-Moon distance is much, much, much smaller than we've indicated. Okay, so let's be honest, stop cheating and shrink our Moon's orbit. Shrink, shrink, shrink. And there the loops are gone and have turned into sharp cusps. So is that what our orbit looks like? Nope. We have to keep shrinking. <laughs> As you can see, the orbit now has shallow waves. But we're still not there. Let's keep on shrinking. So what we've got finally is a convex curve with no indentations that looks like a regular 12 gone with rounded off corners. And that really is what the orbit of the moon around the sun looks like. Just even more rounded and circle like than the curve in our picture. Pretty surprising isn't it? Well it gets even more surprising. <laughs> Turns out that our moon is the only moon in the solar system with a convex orbit. The orbits of all the other moons are of the wavy and loopy types. In fact, because of this planet-like orbit, some experts consider the Earth and the Moon as a double planet and not as a planet-moon system. Okay, let's now have a closer look at our simplified Sun-Earth-Moon setup. In our system, the Earth and the Moon circle around at constant speeds. But what if we vary those speeds? What other orbit shapes are possible? For a really extreme example, the orbit can be a line segment. Yes, that coin rolling business that I showed you earlier can also occur in this setting. Here the moon is the red point on the rim of the rolling circle and the planet is the center of this little circle. But this rolling coin setup also may remind you of some very famous toy. Starts with an S, rhymes with a Y-rograph. Well, yes, it's a spirograph. <laughs> wow, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> all spirograph curves are possible moon orbits and you're all probably aware of the amazing variety of such curves. Here are some particularly remarkable ones. You get perfect ellipses when you keep the size of the little circle the same but move the moon to the inside of the circle. In fact, any shape ellipse can be obtained in this way. Now, change the rolling circle to be one third the size of the big circle. And we get a pretty good approximation of an equilateral triangle. Then, 
with the rolling circle one fourth the size of the big circle, we get a pretty squarish orbit. So conceivably, there's a moon somewhere in the universe that moves around its sun on an essentially square orbit. <laughs> also pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, what if the moon itself has a mini-moon? Astronomers seem pretty certain that at least in our solar system there is no such thing. But of course mathematicians don't have to worry about reality. <laughs> if we want a mini moon of a moon we just create a virtual one. <laughs> what then is possible in terms of orbits of mini moons of moons or mini mini moons of mini moons of moons? <laughs> well, let's have a look at this. Here's a chain of 1000 nested mini moons at work, each one moving at some constant speed around its maximum. And the miniest of the moons follows an orbit in the shape of Homer Simpson. <laughs> this classic animation is the work of Santiago Ginobili. Now that is really, really, really amazing, don't you agree? You'd figure if we get a mini moon to travel along a Homer path, then we can get it to do pretty much anything, right? <laughs> and that's true. Any reasonably nice closed curve can be traced by an orbit of a mini-moon. Actually, we can do even more. Any such loopy curve can be traveled along in infinitely many ways. Slow in some parts and fast in others, going back and forth over the same part of the curve and so on. And every one of these travel variations can be replicated by one of our moon systems. Usually, to get things mathematically spot on, you'll need infinitely many moons. But even with finitely many moons, you can get as close to spot on as you want. The orbits of moons and mini moons are usually called epicycles. And epicycle mathematics has been used for millennia to describe complicated motions. It dates back to Ptolemy and the other ancient Greek astronomers, who used epicycles and other tricks to describe the apparently crazy motions of the planets as observed from Earth. Most of us picture these old geocentric models of the solar system as being very simple, like this. So Earth in the center with the moon, the planets and the sun moving around it on concentric circles. However, every one of the planet circles really stands for a much more complicated orbit. For example, Mars's orbit in the Ptolemaic system looks something like this. Essentially, this is an epicycle orbit with a little extra tinkering thrown in to actually make this into a reasonably predictive model. Copernicus's revolutionary system supposedly swept away much of the complication of the geocentric models by placing the Sun at the center of the solar system. This part of the story is also usually illustrated with a simple picture of concentric circles. However, just like Ptolemy and his Greek mates, Copernicus also resorted to epicycle acrobatics to fine-tune the orbits of the planets. In fact, Copernicus's model of planetary motion wound up being at least as complicated as the Greek geocentric systems and no more accurate. Just to give you an idea, here's a drawing that illustrates the motion of Mars according to Copernicus. Without going into details, doesn't this look even more complicated than the model for Mars in the Ptolemaic system that we looked at before? Well, that's to me. <laughs> of course, what was really needed was replacing all the circles within circles by fundamentally different geometry. The elliptical orbits introduced by Johannes Kepler 60 odd years after Copernicus. Anyway, epicycle mathematics is ages old, even if it's not the simplest approach to studying the heavens. However, it was only at the beginning of the 19th century that the great French mathematician Joseph Fourier published a paper <laughs> that led to a proper understanding of the possibilities of epicycle mathematics and its incredible usefulness outside astronomy. Today this branch of mathematics is called Fourier analysis. For the more technically inclined among you, I will now show you how you can make your own epicycle drawings of whatever takes your fancy. And I'll show you how the epicycle systems underlying these drawings can be reconstructed using complex Fourier series. It gets a little detailed later, so feel free to bail out at any point. <laughs> okay, so down to work on our very important question, how to draw Homer Simpson just using epicycles. And how would you naturally go about finding the answer to this question? We all know, right? Google, Homer and epicycle? <laughs> if you do, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> 
It turns out that this exact question was recently posted on the Mathematica Stack Exchange by someone writing under the pseudonym Understood. Then Understood followed up with an answer including the Mathematica code and explanations. Really brilliant stuff. Let's have a look. As a warm-up Understood describes how to use epicycles to draw the outline of an elephant starting with just a JPEG of a silhouette. To pin down the curve Understood first generates a set of roughly equally spaced points along the perimeter of the silhouette. Then he interprets the coordinates of these points as complex numbers and uses the so-called discrete Fourier transform to calculate epicycle approximations of the silhouettes in terms of complex Fourier series. Very fancy and very scary words but it's all pretty standard stuff. Nothing to panic about yet, promise. The blob at the top was drawn using 20 epicycles. Maybe not so impressive though if you squint a little uh, it has a vague elephantine feel to it. But the bottom picture drawn using 100 epicycles is most definitely an elephant. It all works really well and I've gone on to use Understood's code to generate epicycle approximations to various silhouettes. So have a guess what's being drawn here. Back to Understood. After elephanting he tackles Bart Simpson. So he starts with the drawing over there and his final output looks like, wait for it, this. So really pretty good. Unfortunately the bits of code that Understood provides for also capturing strokes inside the outline don't work straight off the page. There's also a bit of a systemic problem with the centers of the epicycles in the animations being wrongly placed. Having said that, all the ingredients are basically there and it wasn't too difficult to adapt Understood's code and ideas to also reverse engineer the Homer animation. Just really quick, here's what I did. So what I did was I grabbed the screenshot of the original video and cleaned it up in Photoshop and Illustrator. Then again in Photoshop I made a low res version of this drawing in which the outline is drawn as strings of pixels. This is where Mathematica enters the picture for me and you can have a close look at what exactly I do by inspecting my Mathematica notebook linked in from the description. So using Mathematica I generate a list of the coordinates of all the pixels in this picture, well all the black ones. Now we have to order the list of coordinates such that the corresponding points appear in the order in which we want to trace them. Here Understood uses a very neat trick he unleashes the command find shortest tour <laughs> on the list. What this does is it attempts to solve the traveling salesman problem for our set of points. That is it tries to create the shortest round trip that comprises all our points and puts them into the corresponding order. Here's what this round trip looks like. So this is one continuous loop which visits every pixel in our outline exactly once. It's a somewhat quick and dirty solution which includes some undesirable artifacts but it gets us there in finite time which is great. <laughs> now from here we can just use exactly the same code as for the elephant to generate the animation. Not bad huh? <laughs> and if you're keen on something smoother it's just a matter of more accurately generating a string of points that indicates more exactly how you want the original picture traced. Then you feed in the corresponding coordinates and the program does its epicycle magic. Okay here's a challenge for you. Get creative and come up with some epicycle animations of your own and link them in via a comment below. The contribution I like best wins a copy of Marty and my latest book. That one there. Okay in the rest of the video I'd like to really show you how these systems of epicycles are constructed and for that let me just give you a crash course in Fourier series. Should be easy right? 
well it's actually not bad and it's beautiful stuff. So to begin I have to remind you of Euler's formula which has already appeared in about, mm, about a thousand methodology videos. <laughs> so e to the i t is equal to cos t plus i sine t. Euler's formula amounts to a very compact way of tracing or in maths lingo parametrizing the unit circle in the complex plane. To see what I mean have a look at this picture there. So the red point on the unit circle is the complex number cos t plus i sine t. That's the right side of Euler's formula, right? As we let the angle t go from 0 to 2 pi, the red point traces out the unit circle. But now Euler's formula tells us that the red point is also e to the it. So for example, setting t is equal to pi, that is making a half turn, the red point moves to minus 1 of course. So e to the i pi is equal to minus 1, most mathematicians favorite identity. And setting t is equal to 0 we get e to the 0 is equal to 1, which of course is no surprise. Just to say it again, as we let t go from 0 to 2 pi, the red point travels around the unit circle once in the counterclockwise direction. Now let's write minus t instead of t. So e to the minus i t. This corresponds to traversing the circle once in the opposite, the clockwise direction. And if we write 2t instead of t, this corresponds to traversing the circle twice in the counterclockwise direction as t goes from 0 to 2 pi. And if we write 3, 3 times and so on. Here's another important observation. Let's multiply our circle exponential by 4. What does this correspond to? Think about it for a moment. Easy, right? Here we are traversing a circle of radius 4. Another way of expressing this is to say that we traverse the circle through the complex number we multiply by, in this case the number 4, starting and ending at this number. That sounds complicated, but what's nice about this way of looking at things is that this stays true for all complex numbers, not just real numbers like 4. So for example, if we multiply by the complex number 1 plus i, we are now traversing the circle starting and ending at 1 plus i. Okay, as we'll see in a moment, it's expressions of this form. Complex number times e to the i times some integer times t that stand for the different epicycles produced by the magical Fourier machine. And what is the source of the magic of the magical Fourier machine? It's a very simple property of these exponential expressions. It turns out that the integrals of these exponentials from 0 to 2 pi are always equal to 0. Whoa, where did that one come from? <laughs> and how can I possibly claim that this is very simple? Well, it is actually easy if you know a little calculus. Basically it's a straightforward symmetry argument. Any complex number we come across as t goes from 0 to 2 pi is cancelled out by its negative, which we will also come across. Maybe one of you can fill in the details in the comments. Otherwise, just take my word for it for the moment. Okay, so now we are ready to reveal the inner workings of the magical Fourier machine. Let's say we, what we want is to trace this outline of the letter pi at a constant speed as shown. So feeding this to the magical Fourier machine, we create a chain of infinitely many epicycles whose limit moon will do exactly the tracing we are after. Here we go. If we only use the first few epicycles, then the last moon in this finite chain will trace an approximation of our pi outline. And the more epicycles we use, the better our approximation will be. For example, just using the first four epicycles gives this orbit here. Using six epicycles will give this. Here's the output from eight epicycles and so on. Let's now have a close look at the tracing produced by the first four epicycles, this one here. Here we go in slow motion. Mathematically, what you see here is represented by this sum here. There's one term for each of the four circles, which I've color coded, plus the term at the top. 
So what we have here is a straightforward sum of the four individual circular motions. The extra term on top is the complex number that represents the black anchor point. Now let's have a closer look at the exponents of e in these terms. For the blue circle the exponent is 1 times it. Then minus 1 times it for the purple circle, 2 times it for the orange circle and finally minus 2 times it for the red circle. The pattern is obvious. Next in the infinite sum would be 3 minus 3, 4 minus 4 and so on. Every integer appearing exactly once except well there is no zero, right? Well actually the zero is there just in disguise. Here it is. e to the power of zero is one. So the infinite sum that exactly captures the motion we are after is of this form here. So we are producing a doubly infinite sum. Nifty <laughs> if also a little scary. Mm. Just to reiterate the t in everything we are doing ranges from zero to two pi and because we are tracing closed curves Starting and ending at the same complex number, the value of the sum is the same at 0 and 2 pi. This means our sums are periodic functions from the interval 0 to 2 pi to the complex numbers. And so here's another way of expressing what Fourier's magical machine does. The Fourier machine rewrites any sufficiently nice periodic function f of t from the interval 0 to 2 pi to the complex numbers as this sort of two-tailed infinite sum. That's great, but how do we find those infinitely many complex coefficients that precisely pin down our epicycles? Well, that's where the real magic is hidden. Let me show you how you can find one of these coefficients. Let's say c2, the coefficient in front of e to the 2 times it. Let's zoom in on the three terms around this coefficient. To get rid of the e to the 2 times it next to the c2, we multiply our equations by e to the minus 2 times it. Now let's switch to algebra autopilot. Okay, at this stage every single term of our infinite sum, except for the one we are focusing on, features an exponential factor. Now we can use the key integration factor I mentioned earlier to obliterate all the terms except for c2. Ready for the integral magic? Here we go. There it is. Remember I told you earlier that all these integrals are equal to zero and so what's left on the right is this but the green integral is just equal to 2 pi. Dividing through we find an expression that allows us to calculate c2 and of course the exact same trick works for all the other coefficients as well. And so on input of a tracing f of t Fourier's magical machine calculates these coefficients each one exactly specifying one of our epicycles. And here I take a bow to Professor Fourier Absolutely amazing stuff. <laughs> of course I've glossed over a heap of details here but really only details. Maybe some of you in the know can supplement a bit of a discussion of when exactly this works and what can go wrong. There's also still the question of how you actually use this magic machine in practice. How you use it depends very much on how you're tracing the function f of t is given to you. If it comes in a nice form you may be able to evaluate all those integrals. On the other hand if as in the case of our Homer drawing we are given an approximation of our tracing by a sequence of points. In this case there are specialized tools that take these sequences of points as input and produce very good approximations of these integrals. In particular understood in his Mathematica program uses the so-called discrete Fourier transform. A different approach is illustrated in a very nice video by gold-plated goof. <laughs> also very much worth checking out. Okay, so all under control in terms of epicycle mathematics, but what has all this to do with all those real-life applications of Fourier series that you may have heard of? Everything. <laughs>
Just as a bit of a teaser, the animation below illustrates that the famous representation of a square wave as a sum of sine functions is really nothing but the imaginary part of a very pretty system of epicycles. Hopefully I'll eventually get around to dedicating a few more videos to this incredibly beautiful circle of ideas. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And that's it for today.